Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Debbie Schaefer. I am the Director of Media Relations for Advocates for Physicians' Rights. And now I'm going to turn it over to human rights attorney, Lee Dundas. Thank you all very much for coming out today. Uh, today we are asking the Department of Justice and the California State Attorney General's Office to conduct in the state of California a top-down, full-scale investigation of the county health officers, medical doctors, nurses, and other licensed professionals who appear to have engaged in a multi-year campaign engineered to end run and or violate a multitude of federal and state laws which exist in the main to safeguard the privacy rights of the medical information of minor school children in the state, as well as coordinate any prosecutions, impositions of monetary fines, or licensure revocation proceedings against individuals found to have violated these laws. We are further asking the Department of Justice to investigate an apparent cover-up engaged in by these professionals during which they discussed how to avoid fallout from a quote public records act request by co-opting their county council county attorney's offices to open permanent ongoing investigations against these minor children's medical doctors which ongoing investigations they would quote just never close because then the quote entire string of actions would quote never be revealed plus it's got your county counsel protecting the actions by the attorney client privilege which ruse these doctors appear to have planned to affirmatively use as a shield to camouflage their multi-year campaign against the disabled and medically compromised school children in the state and about which ruse they then joked that if it failed it was not cause for alarm because, quote, it is always fun to be sued by those whack jobs. Oh. The whack jobs to which they were referring, just so we're clear, were the parents and families of the medically compromised and disabled school children whose, whose medical files they were planning to violate and invade. At this point, I would like to provide some context. The author of Senate Bill 276, which is currently making its way through this Capitol, has garnered support from the California Medical Association, from the governor's office, from a host of other medical uh, organizations based on one single specific set of facts, which is this. We need to handle the dirty doctors who are writing fake medical exemptions. All of the other problems identified by the bill's author, pockets of under-vaccinated or unvaccinated school children, doctors who pose a risk to their communities from leaving these pockets of school children unvaccinated, potentials for measles outbreaks, all of these problems harken back to one single set of facts, which is dirty doctors writing fake medical exemptions. Unfortunately, the set of facts upon which the bill's author has predicated his bill appears based on the evidence recently uncovered to be at best incorrect and at worst falsely manufactured from the campaign I just talked about. Put simply, the linchpin for SB 276, the ammunition for it, the reason we need it, these dirty doctors writing fake medical exemption appears to be at this point nothing less, nothing more than an outgrowth of a multi-year campaign hatched by Senator Pan's physician colleagues. Can you all see that? Is my clicker working? No. Nope. Can, you, can you make it? Show their faces. County health officers who had planned to violate federal law and gut the private medical files of innocent school children in this state. Allow me to start at what I believe, although I do not know, to be the beginning of this story. While the ink was still drying on Senate Bill 277 a few years ago, which was one of Senator Pan's first bills concerning this issue, a woman by the, the name of Dr. Charity Dean, who was at the time the chief health officer for the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department, took it upon herself 
to send to every school superintendent, every school principal, and every director of a daycare center a letter. And in this letter, she directed all of the foregoing personnel to quote, immediately fax all medical exemptions, permanent or temporary, to the immunization program. She also appointed herself judge, jury, and ultimate arbiter of whether these medical exemptions she was asking people to fax were going to qualify under the newly uh, passed SB 277 standards, or alternatively, if they did not do so, she would find them to be, quote, ineligible. Let me be nothing if not clear. Federal law squarely prohibits the actions taken by a campaign like Charity Dean's. I repeat, federal law prohibits the actions that were taken there. The primary federal law on point, the, the primary federal law on point is known as FERPA. It stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and it protects immunization records and medical exemptions that are part of immunization records as part of a student's educational record. Schools may only release these records for quote, legitimate interests. And the federal government has made clear that campaigns like Dr. Charity Dean's, which involve a blanket release of this type of immunization data, violate federal law. In a case involving the Alabama Department of Education, the state health officer in Alabama ordered the release of the immunization records in that state to the Department of Public Health taking the position that schools were allowed to share this information regarding immunizations. The federal government disagreed. They stated that neither HIPAA nor FERPA, quote, authorizes or permits the disclosure of these medical records. Also clarified was the fact that routine vaccination data, or the lack thereof, and records pertaining thereto, were not an emergency that would have triggered one of the exceptions to this rule or otherwise allow for data mining of students' records under this law. And they went so far as to say that there was, quote, no exception to FERPA that would permit a school to disclose health or other immunization records to a state agency, such as the Department of Public Health. In short, what I am saying is that federal government and federal law say you cannot engage in a blanket release of children's immunization records, even when it is to the State Department of Public Health, and even when your state health officer is the one ordering it. Wow. <laughs> Going back to Dr. Charity Dean, after issuing the above letter, she then proceeded to host a, quote, immunization round table at which most of the 58 counties in California were represented by their medical doctors who had been appointed to the position of county health officer for their region. At this meeting, which was recorded, Dr. Dean verbally recapped her program that directed all of the schools and childcare facilities, and I am direct quoting right now, to send their medical exemptions, all of them, to the public health department. She notably glossed over the federal law issue I just raised, gave it only passing mention in stating that her county uh, council had helped her sidestep a federal law issue, and instead chose to highlight the extreme <coughs> backlash from the community in response to her first letter, which had caused her to release a second letter on June 24th, suggesting that schools might want to redact some of the personally identifiable health information of their students before complying with her orders. But by that point, folks, the damage was done. It was the end of the school year. It appears that a lot of the schools were leanly staffed or not really staffed at all. The first letter had gone out. By the time the second letter went out, it fell on deaf ears. And for a good portion of the last three or four years, it appears that students' health files were incorrectly and in violation of federal law being sent around this state without having been at all redacted or properly redacted, and more to the point, without ever having garnered consent from the parents who were required under this federal law to give it for any release, whether redacted or not. Dr. Dean concluded her opening statements at this meeting by noting that she had been busy recruiting all of the other 57 counties in the state to follow her lead and noting that she already had 12 or 15 participants, quote unquote, signed up, 
and that she was now encouraging the Health Officers Association of California to become the, quote, home base for her campaign. Encouraged by Dr. Dean's invitation, at this point in the meeting, some of the county health officers decided they were going to refine this little campaign and avoid, and I direct quote, being interfered with by the stymieing efforts of the parents of the children. These county health officers, doctors, one and all, apparently decided in my book, I would call this an abuse of authority that was vested in them by their government positions, to create a, quote, alternative approach so that we are, quote, not subject to Public Records Act requests or FOIA requests or document demands in the context of future lawsuits and things of this nature after stating on the record, and I quote again, that we are not wanting to expose ourselves to things that might interfere with this campaign, they were actively hatching to end run the federal laws that prohibit this type of conduct. These doctors proceeded to analyze ways in which they could continue to pillage the medical files of the children who were disabled and medically compromised through a coordinated systemic statewide attack, but to be a little bit smarter about it, than Dr. Dean had been in the first instance, and to hide their actions through the creation, and I quote again, of investigations that we can conduct at any time, or through cobbling together unwarranted referrals to the medical board against these children's doctors, which they noted that they as county health officers can make such referrals, referrals for investigations at any time. And in such a manner, the conspirators agreed that neither the children nor the parents nor the children's pediatricians would ever be able to find out about what was happening, let alone object to it. And I quote, doctor number one, those investigations then are not subject to Public Records Act requests, second doctor, nor are referrals to the medical board, which anyone, including us as health officers, can make a referral for an investigation. Right, you can't even ask. It's none of their business. And when they said that, they meant it's none of the parents' business then or the attorney's business because, of course, now it's protected behind the shield of this investigation. It is, quote, none of their business. It is just an ongoing investigation. And if you never close it out, you're fine because then it's never revealed. Two of the county health officers on the call proceeded at this juncture to take the conspiracy to invade children's private health records a bit further by noting that they could use the above investigations they were talking about commencing as a lever by which to loop in their county council, their county attorney's offices, and create an attorney-client privilege that they can then further hide behind the skirts of. And I continue to quote, because then it is never revealed another doctor. Plus, it's got your county council protecting by the attorney-client privilege. And if you start with county council, that's what you do. That's where you start. Because then the entire string that is attached to it becomes protected from a Public Records Act request. So there are ways of addressing this. It is very unfortunate for Charity that she stepped up and has become targeted. Thank you, Charity, for leading the way. <laughs> Laughter is noted on the record at this point. Thank you for being the human shield, in other words. Yet more laughter is noted on the record. Dr. Dean, yes, well, I am not backing away. Inconceivably, in my mind at this point, the meeting actually devolved further, with one of the county health officers noting toward the end of the meeting, quote, I'm not really interested in going after the parents. There is a systems level opportunity here, and I personally would like to smoke out their physicians. Wow. At which point, around the same time on the record, another doctor chimed in again with the fact that if their little campaign failed, it wouldn't be cause for alarm because it is, quote, fun to be sued by those whack jobs. Again, if you missed my introductory paragraph, the whack jobs to which they were referring were the parents of the disabled and medically compromised school children in this state that they were actively planning a conspiracy to violate federal law on point and get out their, their private medical records. It may be, it may be, that the actions I just described are perfectly fine. It may also be 
that there were multiple violations of federal and or state law. And the simple fact of the matter is this, none of us will know the answer until such time as an investigation is commenced and concluded. It is, that's right. it is not for me to say which laws were violated, if any, or what penalties should be assessed for their violations. But what I do know as an attorney in this state is that there are multiple laws that safeguard the privacy rights of every single one of your medical files in this state or anywhere and my medical files, and your children's medical files. And the sanctions for those who are found to have violated some of these laws range from criminal prosecution to private rights of action that can be brought by the aggrieved parties whose children rights and other rights were violated, to deprivation of all federal funding to schools that were found to have wrongly participated in such violations of federal laws. And in case you are not aware, there are 1,100 plus school districts in this state. There are more than 10,000 schools in this state. And by my count, just under 10% of all of that funding comes from the federal government. <laughs> Finally, some of these laws allow for the imposition of monetary fines on the people who violated them. $2,500 in the first instance, about 10 grand if I recall correctly in the second instance, and $25,000 per violation for the third and any subsequent violation. And it is my understanding that every breach, every breach counts as a separate violation. Today, we are asking the federal government and the state attorney general's office to commence an investigation to uncover which of these laws were violated, if any, and most importantly, I repeat, most importantly, discern by whom they were violated. Yes. <laughs> Further, given the nature of the conduct that you just heard about, the repeated targeting on a systemic countywide and possibly statewide basis of vulnerable populations, the level of intent and collusion that some of those quotes just spoke to, the fact that there appears to have been a calculated cover up of all of this stuff that involved county council's office starting these investigations so that the entire string of deeds or misdeeds, however you want to call it, were then hidden behind county council. And given the fact that those engineering the campaign should have known better because they are doctors in this state. And by the way, they are not just any doctors, they are doctors who we entrusted and were appointed to one of the top spots in the state by which they were supposed to be safeguarding the citizens in their communities, not hunting them. That's right. And finally, and finally, given the dehumanizing speech, the dehumanizing behavior and what I can consider as nothing less than hate speech that was directed by these doctors against the targeted children's, uh, children and their families, many of whom, as you well know, fall into a federally protected class of disabled children. We are asking the Department of Justice and the State Attorney General's Office to impose all warranted sanctions for any violations Woo! found through the To our knowledge, Dr. Dean was never investigated for her role in the above scheme. Instead, and rather inconceivably, she was rewarded. She was appointed by former Governor Brown to one of the top spots in this state for medical professionals. She was appointed to the Assistant Director of the California Department of Public Health, where she still sits. If an investigation determines that either she and or her county health officer colleagues indeed behaved inappropriately, we are further asking the federal government and the state government for her immediate removal from this post. <laughs> and additionally for the removal from their post of any county health officers, doctors, one and all, who were found to have participated in this nefarious scheme that involved hate speech and targeting disabled populations. Yeah. It may be that this scheme to wrongly enforce Dr. Pan's Senate Bill 277 was solely and simply a creation of Dr. Dean. Wow. It is also possible 
that she was not alone in hatching this plan. And that is why we are also asking the federal government today to subpoena all emails and other communications between Dr. Charity Dean and the state medical board, between Dr. Dean and all California legislators, particularly particularly the legislators on whose bill she was working so zealously to enforce, the co-authors and authors of SB 277, to determine if indeed she was acting alone or if in fact she was not acting alone and this was occurring at the behest of any other individuals or state agencies. We are also asking for an immediate notification to every single family whose child or children were found to have been subjected to this campaign or whose information was breached so that they may quickly proceed with all avenues of redress that may be available to them. And we are additionally asking for an investigation of every medical board complaint filed since 2015 against any doctor writing a medical exemption to determine to determine if these complaints were fruit of the proverbial poisonous tree. The facts brought to light today may well explain they may well explain why there have been over a hundred plus investigations of doctors writing medical exemptions that were referred to the medical board and yet not a single one of those was found to have involved wrongdoing. A couple of other things to mention. The first of which is this. It has become readily apparent as of right now that the state of California cannot I repeat, cannot be entrusted with a database. No. Particularly, particularly given that California Department of Public Health, as we all know, is the one who's supposed to be in charge of rolling that database out, and Dr. Dean still sits in a controlling position on that entity. Even well-orchestrated databases designed with the best of intentions and run by honest people can be breached. We simply cannot have children's names, children's addresses, their parents' names and addresses, their school's names and addresses, and their doctor's names and addresses warehoused and sitting around in a database that any clever pedophile or angry ex-spouse or other not good person can hack into and commit harm against that child. Especially, especially when there is no reason for it. We should not be targeting the children in the state. If we have a problem with dirty doctors, we should be targeting the doctors. That's right. And now that we know that the database component of SB 276 appears to have been a simple outgrowth of all of the stuff I just mentioned, it is a bit, in my mind, like asking the wolf to guard the hen house. Let me be nothing if not clear, the state of California just lost the ability to claim any valid reason to warehouse these children's medical records, and sure as shooting, they have lost the ability to claim that they can be trusted to honestly carry out that task without having it devolve into a campaign to unfairly target disabled and medically compromised children, or to quote from the scheme above, smoke out physicians and target the whack job families. Right. Second, in the absence of the data revealed here tonight, this afternoon, the amendments suggested in recent days by Governor Newsom's office, by way of social media, might have been a good start at reforming this bill. But by the time the final language hit, as we all know, this bill is pretty draconian in its current form. It forces doctors to sign documents under penalty of perjury. Moreover, it holds doctors to a guilty until proven innocent standard by which the merest whiff of an allegation or a referral to the state medical board will stay the hand of that physician from practicing in this realm for up to two years. He is guilty until proven innocent. Guys, we don't do this to drug dealers in this state. Why we are doing this to physicians, I, I just, I, there, there are no words. Particularly now that we know that so many of these investigations were probably started from less than honest and compelling reasons. The simple fact of the matter at this point in time is that no amount of amendments, no amount of companion bills can salvage this bill because the combination of overly harsh language in the bill on top of what we now know has been a multi-year campaign to target the doctors and open ongoing investigations that they never close and refer them, probably in an unwarranted fashion, to the medical board, has had the desired effect. 
It has not just chilled medical exemptions in this state, it's darn near killed them. Well, the bill's author has been busy telling all of the parents in this state that if their child needs a valid medical exemption, he or she can get one. And while that bill's author has simultaneously been telling every legislator in the Capitol behind me that same data, the fact of the matter is that parents know that this was not true. And so last week, some of these parents, parents of disabled and medically compromised children in this state, they spent one day, one day, calling dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of doctors' offices in the state that collectively represented, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I believe it was about 800 physicians. Every single call began with, this is a recorded line, so that they were complying with the state law in point. The parents explained to the doctor's offices that they were new here. They explained that their child had suffered an anaphylactic shock reaction in response to a vaccine, and that they knew that they needed a medical exemption now that they're here in California. As we all know, anaphylaxis is one of the only two recognized reasons for a medical exemption under the CDC guidelines, which the current bill is tied to. And do you know what these parents heard time after time after time after time after time? No. 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 guys to see if we can adjust the volume so that you can actually hear what you're seeing. difficulties, but uh, you were spot on a second ago. The parents heard over and over and over and over again that no doctor's office would write a medical exemption, not even based on an anaphylactic reaction response or other very severe responses. This is not standard of care. There is one word and only one word for what this is, and it is straight up institutionalized discrimination, the likes of which we haven't seen in decades.
Alrighty, folks. Uh, that was not the clip we intended to play, but at least we got one of them working. Uh, there will be new data uh, that we play at the end of this. In the final analysis, I know many doctors who are part of the California Medical As Association who have been members of that association for decades and who are proud to be members of that organization. I know many of the attorneys who work as counsel for the California Medical Association. And as recently as last week, I was privileged to speak to a gentleman who works on behalf of the California Medical Association. And to a man and to a woman, I have found them to be honest and upstanding citizens. I believe California Medical Association was asked to support a bill based on a fact pattern they had no idea about. They were asked to support this bill because there were dirty doctors writing fake medical exemptions. I do not believe for a second that they knew that this set of facts was as it was portrayed to be here today based on the other realities that have been uncovered and that those facts were largely created from what it appears out of thin air. And I do not believe for a second that if they knew where the roots of this bill went, that they would have supported this bill. I think, I don't know, but I think it may have changed their analysis. Similarly, I was privileged to meet the governor's wife first partner Jennifer Newsom last week at a round table that she was hosting at Sacramento State on the subject of equality. After watching her speak passionately and very intelligently for two hours on this topic and then meeting her briefly at the end, I have zero doubt, zero doubt that her and Governor Newsom, her husband, are committed to a golden state that does not just preach about equality, but actually practices it for all people, for all religions, for all colors, for all sexual orientations, for all nationalities, for all adults, for all children, for all disabled people, and for all people who aren't disabled. And I know with every fiber of my being that they believe what you and I believe, that California can and should lead the way in achieving the ideals we hold true, particularly equality. Not for a single solitary second do I believe that Governor Newsom knew any more than any of the other supporters knew that he was being asked or his institution was being asked to support a bill that was built on the backs of a campaign to violate the medical files of disabled and compromised children in the state and whose unseemly roots go back to doctors, county health officers who were hunting the very kids they were supposed to be protecting while attempting to smoke out their physicians and then and then engaging in hate speech to justify their actions and write off the parents who were concerned as whack jobs. I don't believe for a second that they knew that. I don't believe anybody standing in front of me probably knew that and for sure I know I didn't know that. The but dogs. now that we do know, we have a duty, folks. We have a duty to let the federal government and the state attorney general's office investigate and to not pass into law a bill, SB 276, that appears to have been an outgrowth and birthed from conspiracies, medical board referrals that may not have been justified, and quite simply government actors in the form of county health officers who are doing nothing less than abusing the positions of trust they had been entrusted with. We need to understand the extent of wrongdoing. And as I have said twice before, we need to understand who was involved in this wrongdoing. We are asking today, we are respectfully asking that Governor Newsom do nothing, do nothing with this bill until such time as the investigations have started and finished. Finally, to any lawmakers, my final footnote, to any lawmakers who may be asked to vote in the future on SB 276 or a companion bill to it, I encourage you, one and all, to look at the data that was revealed here today. And after such time, I believe you will feel, as we do, that SB 276 was indeed the fruit of a poisonous tree. To cast a vote in support of this bill at this point in time now, in light of the evidence that we just uncovered, is to do nothing less than cast a vote for discrimination, plain and simple, guys. It is the 21st century. It is the 21st century equivalent of telling Rosa Parks, not just that she has to sit in the back of the bus or has to give up her seat on the bus to a white person, but that she can't even get on the bus or take it to school.
to quote William Wilberforce, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. We can do better than this, California, and we must. Right. Thank you very, very much for coming out. I know that we have legislators who were able to uh, to depart briefly from their overwhelming amount of work at the end of legislative session and come out today. I am going to turn the microphone back over to our press person, uh, Debbie Schaefer. I believe she wa has somebody that she wants to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Dundas. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we this video was released last week. We have a second video that has dropped on social media. Uh, it is a six minute version of this, which shows many, many more clips of doctors denying medical exemptions for anaphylaxis. So please go on to social media and view that video. Um, we also have a clip at the end of new audio files if you wanna stick around for that. Uh, do you want me to introduce? Okay, with no further ado, we would, uh, we are honored to introduce Senator Brian Jones. Good afternoon. I just have a, a couple of uh, brief comments. Hopefully, uh, mostly uh, to encourage you in, uh, in not giving up. Uh, Winston, Winston Churchill said in the face of World War II, never, 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 <laughs> never give up. I've been here for seven years, uh, having served in the assembly for six years, and now uh, one year in the state senate, having gone through SB 276 and now SB 277. And uh, in that same amount of time, have seen about 8,000 other bills come through this legislature. Too many bills. And to way too many bills. <laughs> about uh, 7,792 many two bills. <laughs> Uh, of those 8,000 other bills, none, zero, have elicited the uh, passion, the outpouring, the community interest that these two bills have elicited from the citizens of California. Yep. Of those 8,000 other bills, none, zero have been ignored by the opponents as these two bills SB 276 and 277 have been ignored uh, by the legislature of your interests and your activities and your passion on this subject matter uh, so yesterday as we were debating 277 and many of you were up in the gallery and uh, you know, paying attention to what's going on and watching your legislature ignore your pleas, ignore your uh, appeal, ignore your redress of uh, SB 276. Thank you for those of you that are correcting me up there. Um, I was amazed, actually, uh, at, at my colleagues. And I was uh, reminded of a founding document, the Declaration of Independence. Woo! And I think often too many times my colleagues forget to read our founding documents and the actual strength That's right. uh, of the message that they send to uh, tyrants. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in the, uh, in the, towards the end of the Declaration of Independence, after Thomas Jefferson has outlined the 27, uh, 27 complaints that the colonies had against uh, the monarchy, he, he finishes up the 27 complaints with this paragraph. In every stage 
of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be ruler of a free people. That's right. That's right. And I want you to understand from my perspective that the legislature has taken on the characteristic and the um, position of a tyrant. Your petitions and your redress of repeated injury have been presented in the most humble terms. You have been uh, patient, you have been kind, you have been um, deliberate, and you've been humble in bringing your redresses to this Capitol building. And each and every time, those redresses have been returned with further injury. So I just want to say this. In America, we have a peaceful way to change out our government. And it comes every two years. And I want you to know that you have the power. You have the energy. You have the passion. You have the organization to change who rules over you. And my prayer and concern is that at the next opportunity that you have an opportunity to make a change at the ballot box, that you will show up and speak loud and clear that you're not going to tolerate a tyrant <coughs> ruling over you in a free state of California. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this point, we are pretty much concluded with our presentation. Uh, anybody who has inquiries, press, and the like, uh, please direct them to my colleague, uh, the esteemed Deborah Schaefer. She is all about that. I'm just a humble attorney that knows nothing. Uh, and I do believe for the concerned parents in the crowd who would like to hear more audio files uh, that other parents, this was not our group, it was just a, a group, an ad hoc group of concerned parents put together, um, we would be happy to release that to you now if you would like to sit and listen to it. Thank you. So, uh, my office, you know of anybody, anybody's business. Okay, so we have a strict rule that's by our providers in this office specifically that all of the children here are immunized without exception. Even if my son has a, you know, a medical reason that he can't? Yeah, she doesn't do no, no, no exceptions at all for any vaccine. I uh, know we don't, we don't write any medical exceptions here. Yeah, no, we, we are a practice that they should all be vaccinated and getting their vaccines. She are taking she is taking new patients only if they're vaccinated and up to date with all the vaccines. There's there's no they have to get up in California. For them to not to be uh, not to be vaccinations, they would have to be homeschooled. Well that's medical exemption. I'm not sure she will do that as far as I know she doesn't have any Thank you again for coming and um, be sure to check social media for that uh, second video with more audio like this and share, share it, spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a few places it, it's going to be on Advocates for Physicians Rights, social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Freedom Keepers will be posting it. Uh, Melissa Floyd will have it on her page. I think jo Josh, Josh Coleman will have it on his, uh, Toby's, Twitter. So please um, just head there and then start sharing. Thank you. All right, we are back. Thanks for tuning in. Please, please share this. This was huge for California.
Um, this was Jessica and Rachel reporting. I'm just unscrewing my camera here from the tripod. Pray big for California. This is incredible news today. I think we're all a little in shock, but good things are happening. Pray big, we're winning.